Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Christopher Drysdale from Re-Exploration. Did I pronounce that properly, Christopher? Correct, yeah, Re-Exploration. Now, Re-Exploration is a new one for me, and you're in Namibia. So how about we start with why Namibia, Christopher? So Namibia um, is arguably one of the most stable and best jurisdictions in Africa, and they have a long, proud history of mining. They've got three of the world's largest uranium deposits. And no matter how you cut it, Africa is going to play a massive role in this critical minerals market and how we play it. And the positioning of where these projects are based in terms of political stability, access to infrastructure, access to uh, credible technical uh, partners, or experienced uh, workforce, Namibia is head and shoulders above a lot of other uh, jurisdictions that are sitting in Africa. So why Namibia? Up until recently been relatively underexplored for critical minerals. Uh, a lot of focus has been towards uranium and diamonds uh, historically. Over the last couple of years, it's got a lot of a light shone on it from a lot of successful gold exploration. And we felt that there was a, a attractive opportunity to look for a very good rare earth exploration project down here. And, and we came across one called the Eureka Project. So that's why Namibia, it's by far one of the, the best jurisdictions to be based in. You mentioned the port uh, in Namibia when we started uh, just before the interview. Can you tell us a little bit more about the competitive advantages of the port in Namibia? So the Valfus Bay port, which is about 180 kilometers away from our project on a main road, is arguably the best port on the west coast of Africa and has direct routes that service, already are servicing uh, North America, Europe, as well as other parts of the east through the Valfus Bay uh, transport corridor. Not only that, because of the three, some of the largest uh, uranium mines, uh, just to mention to Rossing and Husab, these mines have been sending uh, their concentrate and yellow cake uranium through that port. And there's already an established uh, infrastructure, understanding and process in, in terms of handling critical minerals or the likes of uranium to allow for the shipping of that. Secondly, with it being positioned on the west coast of Africa, it's, it's got a direct link to North America and Europe without having to go around Africa or around the Horn or through the Suez Canal. It does give a, uh, it does give a strong option for us to send directly to the, to the places that are currently looking for these minerals and looking for Western aligned minerals. So it's strategically a, a strong position to be in. When I was researching about you earlier, uh, you were tagged for doing something different. You have a metallurgy first development approach. Can you tell us what that means? Yes. Yeah, so when we started looking at rare earth projects in the uh, early 2017, we spoke to a lot of uh, industry leaders and experts and a lot of academics to understand where the bottleneck and where, where the issue with rare earths actually lies. From a crustal abundance point of view, rare earth minerals are actually abundantly available, in, but extracting it, we found, and getting to a Western amenable product that allows for uh, further use up in the value chain, that was the problem and where the dominance uh, from China started to be built. So we decided to flip exploration on, on its head and use a met uh, metallurgy first approach where we would look at rare earth projects and be able to solve uh, the metallurgy and extract a product first uh, at scale before looking for scalability of the deposit. So we looked at, can you produce a product? And is that product uh, amenable to Western standards? And what I mean by that, uh, it has a low thorium, content so it doesn't have high radioactivity so it allows for simple shipping to areas it has products that are easily winnable through conventional um, processing 
that to allow us to produce a product that then can go into individual oxides. And that uh, science and that technology is available by two Western uh, countries. And once we ticked those boxes, we then decided to do general exploration and look for scalability of the deposit, knowing that we've already solved or uh, simplified the processability and metallurgy of those projects. Well, it sounds to me like you're achieving these goals. Uh, you've had a flurry of news releases in the last month. Let's start with the Eureka project and what's happening with the rare earth discovery. So, yes, we've had two very positive announcements recently. Uh, I'll start with the first one. It was the identification of our new anomaly, which we've named Clover. That soil anomaly, from a geochemical point of view, is a magnitude bigger than what we've picked up in our Eureka Dome uh, up until date with all our exploration. Uh, we've got geochemistry up, up to 8.75% uh, TREO in surface geochemistry with confirmed uh, visible mono monazite in carbonatite on surface. And this really is a you know undrilled monster that hasn't previously been tested in any of our other drilling and from a surface expression has a massive footprint with higher TREO numbers in the geochemistry than we've seen previously. We've recently completed a magnetic survey over that, and we will be starting to define drill targets over that uh, over that target, as well as others that we've identified on the dome in, in due course. Then we've also spent a lot of time looking at the work we've done previously uh, between 2020 up until recently, and taking the data and applying a lot of uh, desktop review uh, integrated with the uh, working with a lot of our uh, strategic and technical advisors. And we've come up with a deposition model that has that is starting to build up shape, which we announced through the identification of these deep seated magnetic bodies. We know that carbonatites, uh, carbonatites and rare earths come from a very deep uh, system. And these deep seated magnetic bodies, which uh, are highly magnetic, uh, and we also know that our monazite is associated with, with iron, do form within areas and do look extremely promising within the exploration model of, the deep, uh, of these deeper structures and deeper systems that are required for the deposition of economically important carbonatite hosted mineralization. So we're really excited about, the, uh, about these conceptual magnetic um, targets. We've started a uh, looking at doing a gravity survey over these targets, and our in-house exploration team is looking at how best to define these. And that's going to lead to us defining drill targets over these uh, magnetic bodies. Um, and we're very excited on it. So we've got two things there. We've identified a, a new area, which is from a scale and from a TREO perspective, uh, a lot bigger and a lot better than we've previously seen with visible monocyte on surface. And then our historical stuff, we've started realizing, uh, started looking at it again and started mapping and understanding these deep seated features that fit in with a, uh, a deposition model, which is shows scalability to our project and, and could pro prove up size potential. For those of you out there who may not be familiar with monazite, for instance, can you explain which rare earths you actually have? Because you have some of the core four, the neodymium and the presidium. Can you tell us a little bit more about your, your uh, target discovery? So we, are, we mainly are looking for uh, neodymium and presidium, a monazite hosted neodymium and presidium project. The reason why we're looking for monazite hosted uh, rare earths is because it is the easiest with the most conventional uh, way of cracking rare earths out of it. And cracking is a term that is used that allows you to break the individual metals out of what it is, the mineral that it is hosted in. Other rare earth projects that are held in uh, other um, hosts, such as Alanite or along those lines have a complex cracking uh, process 
uh, that has not only uh, complexities from a metallurgy point of view to it, but also has environmental concerns in terms of the acids that are required to break that hosting mineral down. Mon monazite is the most uh, is the easiest and the simplest in terms of beneficiation of the individual rare earth oxides. From there, our monazite it, uh, is compromised of various rare earths, but the le leading value driver within our monazite is the neodymium sodium, which which is a massive uh, massive amount to our basket. Uh, neodymium and prosadium are two elements that are extremely critical in the high frequency magnets and the drivetrains and from a military use and from a defense use. Uh, those are the two minerals that are uh, short. The supply is currently controlled by China uh, in terms of where it's coming from and the cost uh, to it uh, by getting it through China at the not only from a cost perspective, but from a social perspective is what is driving a lot of this geopolitical trade tension for rare earths. So for how that, how that benefits us, our, our simple monazite, which we know has got easy metallurgy and we can win a project, uh, uh, achieve a product that is amenable to Western standards. And that product is a high value product, neodymium and prosadium that is used uh, in defense in the transition to greener energy and magnets and, and drivetrains, that makes us very confident that we're on the right, we're in the right space and looking for the right mineral. And of course, you have also completed your maiden 43101, and you actually have an estimate on your resource. Is that correct? Yes, exactly. So we we've got a 310,000 ton uh Maiden resource at 4.8% TREO, with with 0.7% of that being uh, NDPR, uh, and we've got a proven metallurgy process that allows us to win up to 60% of our rare earths, which is actually uh, one of the uh, industry leaders in terms of its uh, extractability and its amenability to extracting those rare earths. So just from a fact perspective, we've de-risked the project. Uh, we've got a resource that is proven with a high TREO value, with a high amenable uh, um, metallurgy. But we've got a 60% uh, concentrate that we can produce with simple washer tables uh, off the shelf. There's nothing um, new that we have to do or understand that. And now we're looking for more. Uh, and again, leading into what we've recently picked up with the clover uh, with the, the new clover anomaly, that's an order of magnitude and size bigger. And also the soil samples are an order of magnitude, magnitude higher in terms of their TREO content. They're up to eight eight percent. So we're very positive that we can expand on that known resource and de-risk factor. So what is the timeline then for the rare earth project? What milestones are you looking forward to achieving next, Christopher? So the first milestone is the completion of this magnetic survey that we're busy completing over the clover, uh, the new clover anomaly. That is expected to be completed shortly and will be used to uh, identify drill targeting on that target, on the clover target. Secondly, we're busy planning a gravity survey to further better define these uh, conceptual magnetic bodies that we announced uh, uh, just a couple of days ago. And together with those two, two uh, exploration milestones hit, we'll be then defining a drill program over the Eureka Rare Earth Project to start showing scalability and size, uh, size potential of the Eureka Rare Earth Project. So we expect to have those two programs completed uh, during the course of the festive season. Uh, over here, we don't have any issues with winter. We've got all year round access to our project. We've got uh, the main road, which is two kilometers away from our project. I, I like to joke with my Canadian investors and say, the road from our site is better than the road to a lot of the airports in Canada. 
So we've got all your access. We'll be busy working during the festive season and come January, February, looking to get drills turning uh, based off the results from those two geophysical surveys that we'll be com completing. And for everybody following the rare earth sector and you're looking for more information on re-exploration, please go to the following website. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you very much. And we look forward to sharing more of our stories and sharing the results from uh, our exploration program as it continues.